Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. My name is Spencer Walsh. Thank you so much for joining us here today. This is Newsflash, and we got a good one for you. Here is what is on the show tonight. We got live updates. January 6th, Donald Trump could not be moved to halt some of the violence that we saw on that day. Despite some pretty strong pleas by some of his top allies, he did nothing as violence raged on. I'm leaving live updates on the committee hearing happening now. And um, yeah, keep you up to date on what it all means. Is there anything actually serious happening being said? Or is it just continual Washington parlor games? From the same type of people that brought you Russiagate and so much more. And guys, I'll say it once, I'll say it twice, I'll say it three times. Donald Trump will not be criminally charged by this. We still have to take him seriously. A great piece by Ben Beckett in Jacobin Magazine. We're going to go over about why we are not out of the woods on the Trump threat quite yet. Also, interesting moves from Andres Manuel Lopez. Pez Obrador in Mexico. He's the president there. And what he is doing, he's wildly popular, by the way, among Mexicans. And I mean, wildly popular. Um, it's just not just because of his domestic policies. AMLO is playing a key role in challenging U.S. dominance in Latin America. And we will also take a look at the Democratic Party continuing to try to destroy itself from the inside. Let's see Flash. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get right into it here today. We got a good one for you, as always. But, yeah, we're starting here today at the top with the latest on the January 6th hearing. It's a lot of drama. It's a lot of craziness to saying he didn't do this, he didn't do that. I've been pretty consistent on the January 6th hearing from the beginning. I personally think uh, a lot of the stuff is, you know, it's hard to really convince Americans um, you're not doing any kind of like, kind of po- political show here when all you're doing pretty much is coming out night after night and saying things that we already know about Donald Trump. Like, he, yes, of course, he was one of the people who was behind firing up um, – or pretty much the main person, the main instigator on that particular day of getting the crowd to go down the Capitol. He wanted this to happen. He was, you know, completely for it. I think for most Americans who were paying any sort of attention, this was not the most, you know, shocking, revelatory event. You know what I'm saying? Um, You know, this was a pretty clear, you know, out front situation. But what I think is a far more interesting question is, you know, I think no one disagrees. This riot probably would have been stopped if there had been appropriate p- police in front of the Capitol, why were there not appropriate police in front of the Capitol on that day? Was it because, you know, they were like told to stand down by Donald Trump? You know, that, that I think would be a revelatory thing. I think that would be something new that we, you know, a lot of people didn't know. And that would explain why people were get, able to get in through the Capitol so easily. Or was it, an, you know, I think it's a question that, you know, it that explains, literally explains why the riot happens. I don't know why anyone just isn't straight up asking that. Uh, instead, it's a lot of like, oh, you know, did Trump, uh, you know, what it's painting the picture of what Trump's attitude was like on that day and what his mindset was, what he was thinking, what he was saying um, about the riot as it happened and how little he did, of course, to stop it. So... Yeah, so obviously here, this is from the New York Times. The House Committee is investigating uh, the uh, investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Returned to prime time on Thursday to deliver what amounts to the closing argument in the case is made against former President Donald J. Trump, accusing him of dereliction of duty for failing to call off the assault carried out in his name. For 187 minutes on January 6th, this man of unbridled destructive energy could not be moved. Representative Benny Thompson, Democrat of Mississippi and chairman of the committee, said in an opening remarks, not by his aides, not by his allies, not by the violent chance of rioters or the desperate uh, pleas of those facing down the mob. He could not be moved. Uh, Thursday night's presentation is the culmination of weeks of gripping hearings designed to document for the public and for history the relentless efforts by Trump and his allies um, to subvert the 2020 election, efforts that led to, of course, the violent mob assaulting the Capitol on January 6th and a desperate bid to stop the election's final certification. Using testimony from some of Trump's top aides, including his deputy national security advisor, his top lawyer, his spokeswoman, and others, the committee on Thursday accused the president of having been derelict in his duty to protect Congress, saying he did nothing to help 
for more than three hours as he watched the attack play out on live television from just outside the Oval Office. From uh, for the House lawmakers, though, the accusation of an action by Trump in the face of a threat to one of the country's most dem- democratic institutions. <laughs> yeah, one of them to the House of Representatives, I guess you could say, is you know technically you know on its face a democratic institution. Uh, the Senate, of course, is not. Uh, but it was the final piece of a narrative they insist Americans must not ignore. Um, and of course, it comes at a time where you know the whole backdrop to this is just a, an America that just does not seem to function in a normal way. Um, you know, with Trump, it was a lot more just the political norms kind of falling down. But here with Biden, it's a lot of some of the, you know, the most key um, things that we rely on. You know, when it starts to get material, when the quality of life starts to go down, that's when, you know, it's really hard for a lot of Americans to kind of look past that because we rely on a pretty high quality of life to keep things going here. And if that is not, if that's not met in the, in the form of cheap gas, in the form of, you know, meat that's accessible, food that, you know, doesn't cost people a bunch of money to, you know, to buy. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's, you know, the highest living standards, just kind of basic. But uh, people are going to really start to get mad. And I don't think, um, you know, I've seen, what I've seen a lot of actually is I've seen a lot of people come out, uh, especially on the kind of centrist liberal side, who are just completely de- detached, detached from reality, these people who are coming out and saying, you know, if if you're not watching these January 6th committees, committee meetings and, you know, are going to support Joe Biden in 2024, you know, I don't know if I can even speak to you anymore because, like, it, they're just not paying attention to what's going on. Like, you know, of course, am I – is this a, you know, a Republican podcast? We're going to start advocating for Republicans? Absolutely not. But – what the dereliction of duty here is on the other side is, and what the is always has been the Democratic strategy, is to say, but the other guy, but the other guy, but the other guy. It worked, that's what they tried in 2016, 2018, and 2020. It didn't work in 2016, worked in 18 and 20, and most likely in the face of massive uh, price costs for energy, food, gas, all that stuff, um, you know, it is not going to work in 2024. Uh, or, by the way, in 2022, this November, that is not going to be something that I think people will take to very, very calmly. Um, you know, it's, it's just not an effective political strategy. Um, we had Adam Kissinger, Republican of Illinois, saying that Thursday's testimony would show that President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes um, between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home. He chose not to act, uh, saying it's a real... You know, conscious decision for Trump to kind of let the country burn here, which, by, by the way, you know, I, we, I, it's not all the most surprising thing in the world. Like, am I supposed to sit here shocked that he would do this? You know, is this, is this going to encapsulate, like, swing? Because you got to under, I think people just don't understand how American politics works. The way it works is there are, it's, and it's, you know, something that a lot of people don't get, it's along, you know, class lines. It's along people who are, um, very much, uh, you know, you know, very much caring about, you know, or well, even if they see himself or not, like they're very much uh, following politics along class lines because um, you have the the two poles, right, the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, Team Blue and Team Red. Um, you know, you got those people in the you know rich people in the big cities, uh, people in you know kind of inner suburbs. Those are the people who are following MSNBC. You know, tweeting on Twitter, you know, all these like the, the resistance, all this stuff. These are the people who really kind of make up the Democratic base. These are the people who are, you know, uh, driving this, driving, you know, any kind of Democratic enthusiasm as little as they care about anything their base has to say. And of course, then you got the Republican base, which, by the way, the people, again, people who are following this, the people who are entrenched in these day to day hearings, the people who watch Fox News day in and day out are more wealthy. Um, the people who watch MSNBC day in, day out, they're more wealthy. One might be a construction foreman. The other might be a middle manager in New York City or something like that. Either way, they are going to – they're pretty much two sides of the same coin. They follow politics. They pretty much root for Democrat or Republican no matter what with very little exceptions. Um, you know, and they're just like, you know, Republican Party, right wing, can do no wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those people – are going to be against January 6th. They're going to say 
anything that comes out of it, they're not going to care about because they are true red, ruby red Republicans. They're not going to care. Democrats, they're already invested 100% in what they think Liz Cheney is a hero. They think uh, Donald Trump should, be, should have been locked up in 2016. They thought he was a Russian asset. They thought he was this. They thought he was like, you know, selling our country out to Ukraine in the first impeachment scandal, whatever. Um, you know, they are with you 100% on all these issues. But, you know, the middle of the country, the middle of the country, it's not, you know, this, also people who just, you know, st- stuck in between because the two great arguments are so hard to decide from. These are people who have very correctly, I would say, been able to ascertain, say, hey, look, the government doesn't work for me, blue or red, I've tried both, I'm out, I- I'm not doing this. And if you think the way that they're going to come out, if you think non-voters are people who are, you know, kind of depoliticized, people who just given up on politics but maybe used to go, go one way or the other, if you think what's going to turn them back into politics is the January 6th hearings, I'm sorry, you have another thing coming um yeah so i mean even with you know bold claims here i think there's just like there's so much more going on in this country that affects people's lives on the day-to-day um that you know they're saying hey you know don't go too don't get too confident trump's gonna have to steal the next election from you either you just might lose it on your own accord um yeah so here here's elaine luria talking about the the thrust of the hearing tonight his duty uh let's take a look Our hearings have shown the many ways in which President Trump tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power in the days leading up to January 6th. With each step of his plan, he betrayed his oath of office and was derelict in his duty. Yeah, so apparently these um, are supposed to be the most harrowing hearings to watch uh, in the Capitol, which, I mean, yeah, that's great. But, like, the question is, is anyone caring? Is anyone paying attention? Um, you know the the, the capital hearing uh, capital hearings there certainly one thing, but um, the the threat of Trump and Trumpism I think is another thing. Whether how seriously we take that is that here to stay? What is the situation? We're going to break that down in just a second. Stay with us. My name is Spencer Walsh. This is the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. And if you are listening to one of our podcasts, whether it's Newsflash, Hidden History, The Spencer Walsh Show, or something else, ladies and gentlemen, we have one simple request of you. Please be sure to rate us, subscribe to us if you like us, and leave us a comment because just like all of you, sometimes we need that feedback in our lives, good or bad. We want to hear what you have to say. So please do those steps. Make SWR and content better. And thank you so much for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Newsflash 613, a long legacy of news, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we are talking about Trump and Trumpism, you know, with this January 6th hearing that we are seeing right now, it's kind of hard, kind of easy, actually, to say, you know, oh, Donald Trump's done. He's got no shot in the next election. Um, and, you know, if you're in that kind of mindset, it's not the most crazy thing to see. It's not the most, you know, you could see it happening. Um, but here's a case here from Ben Beckett about why we still have to take Trump seriously. Last week, Trump all but announced he will run for president in 2024. In my own mind, I've already made that decision, Trump told Olivia Nuzzi of the New York Magazine, uh, adding the main question for him was not whether he would run, but whether to announce his campaign before or after the 2022 midterm elections. Trump has also been meeting with big donors to gauge support for a 2024 run, Politico reported. Uh, it would be great if we could treat, treat Trump as the loser has been that he in many ways is. Does anyone really want to think about another four years of Donald Trump and all this craziness? Like, um, it's not like we're going to have, you know, exactly normal politics again. And, you know, but the question is, do we want people, you know, you know, the Biden style of it? Or do we do we want this this moment here that's playing in the background that you probably won't be able to like, understand very well because obviously this is an audio podcast but this is the video sound of him hugging and kissing the flag at CPAC uh, if you remember that if you want to go look that video up but that's it's always a classic there um, unfortunately though we still have to take Trump seriously he remains the most popular p- figure in the Republican Party by far uh, and most importantly he's the man most uh, man, the intersecting forces of right-wing activism and the right-wing judiciary need for 2024. 
uh, any other ex-president who has achieved so little in office, who has lost the Electoral College vote and popular vote by significant margins, who improvised in a failed and ridiculous coup d'etat, and who has faced real possibility of indictment and other serious legal problems across the multiple venues, uh, had might have considered sitting out 2024. But there's a good chance he views it for him as some sort of like legal protection, just being in office um, for the right amount of time until he can just you know kind of either die or you know the kid charge against a drop whatever um yeah and as we know though trump is just not just any ex-president he left the white house uh just as much of an outlier as when he entered it he's never admitted to failing at anything much less let failure alter his course while it's always impossible to tell how much of his own rhetoric trump believes and how much is bluster he maintains that he was a legitimate winner of the 2020 race something again still two-thirds of republicans agreed with in a 2021 poll like it is a unpopular minority of republicans who think that this joe biden is a legitimate president uh, at this point in time um, and I think that, yeah, that, that is something that, you know, if you look at that, if you had still such strong support on that aspect, it is so hard to imagine, um, you know, someone like Ron DeSantis coming in, stealing the thunder, because I think that the thing that a lot of people just don't always get is that, um, Ron, like, if Ron DeSantis wants to run, he's going to have to make a case against Trump. And what is that case going to be? I can't personally think of how he a, a route for him to come in and say Trump is bad. Um, I, I just because I just don't think there's enough people who are willing to just take the route of we want the Trump policies without the Trump uh, personality because the Trump personality, the Twitter account, as people uh, you know, DeSantis supporters like you know I like Trump, I didn't like the Twitter account. Well, that sorry, that's still about thirty three percent of the Republican Party as it stands, and you're not going to go very far uh, in a situation like that. Um, so, you know, that that makes it you know, very, very hard for anyone to really imagine Trump failing on a broad scale. Um, so maybe Trump's interview with Nuzzi is out of barking to distract from his failures in the office and his potential prosecutions, uh, and maybe he isn't hosting rallies across the country to maintain his profile, as candidate, but just to satisfy his pathological need for attention, and maybe Republican voters will really abandon him in 2024, the way some of the media are kind of wishing they are. Um, the but it does seem again much more likely that um, this is kind of wishful thinking, and Trump will run and dispatch his stuffed suit GOP rivals with little more than clever insults, just as he did in 2015, exerting about as much effort in the process as it takes to shoo away a fly. If Trump does run again, that leaves one thing between him and the White House, Joe Biden. Biden insists he will run for re-election despite two-thirds unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented numbers of Democrats saying that they do not want Joe Biden to run, um, you know, and potential replacements practically drooling at the prospect of taking his place. Um, you know, it is it is very, very interesting. Uh, that is something that you know, is an insider in a piece about that. That's very interesting. Um, you know, it's going to be really, really qu quite incredible. Biden he pretty much failed to dis discipline his own party enough to pass any significant legislation and refuses to leverage the power of executive orders, which could shore up an unprecedented, unprecedented support by, for example, uh, helping tens of millions escape student debt, which is now less popular than Trump was. And yeah, he's now less popular than Trump was at the same point in his presidency. Uh, with prices and rent soaring, wages stagnant, and any hope of more pandemic era social relief reduced to pretty much a cruel joke, voters are in a pessimistic, pessimistic mood. Just 13% say the country is headed in the right direction. Biden does have an narrow lead over the Trump in the polls, though, with a 44% favoring him versus 41% for Trump. It's an open question how well this can hold up again once campaigning begins and all the gazillion things that will happen from now till the election happen. Um, meanwhile, it appears, though, that January 6th hearings have had no effect on Trump's popularity. Like, if you're if you're watching this and you're like an MSNBC person who's been there through Russiagate, been there, like, been a Rachel Maddow viewer through it all, like, how must you be feeling right now? That is tough. Uh, to see that this this is happening like the way it is. Finally, we should consider the increasing real possibility that Trump could come president even out without winning the most votes in the Electoral College. Um, in, uh, sorry, so you're just doing like what he did in 2016, uh, winning um, popular vote reasons. Um, but not even that. He could just he could just go like literally have states determine his own elect electors. 
Um, there's a very strong chance the reactionary Supreme Court will issue a ruling next year that would give Republican state legislatures free reign in handing out their state's electoral votes however they wish. That is, they could give their state's electors to Trump, even if Biden won the most votes. So um, they could just go out in Pennsylvania, in Arizona. They could go out, you know, all these states. They could go out and do it. They could just say, you know what? We, as a state legislature, we're just going to pick whoever we want to go to the Senate on that January 6th type day, 2024, certify the electors for Biden, uh, sorry, for Trump, even though more people may have voted for Biden. Um Legislators and conservative activists have been preparing for this moment for some time, especially since Trump's failed 2020 re-election campaign, passing a raft of enabling legislation at the state level and stuffing supposedly nonpartisan elector elections offices with far-right conspiracy theories. All the while, they drill into their voter base again and again that Biden only beat Trump because of massive fraud, fraud they insist they will stop one way or the other from happening again. When you put all the pieces together, it certainly looks like right-wing activists and a right-wing Supreme Court are laying the groundwork to seize the presidency in 2024, regardless of the real outcome. All they need is a candidate with enough bravado and arrogance to brazen through the obvious lies it would require. Somebody like Donald Trump. And, you know, with that thought in mind, I think it's, you know, definitely something to keep interestingly here in the back of your mind. All right, let's go to our next story in just a bit. Uh, We will do that in, yeah, we'll do that in 30 seconds. Good. It is definitely good to be back here on Newsflash today. We're talking today, taking a trip south of the border, as they say, down to Mexico. Um, when Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador traveled to Washington on uh, July 12th, his most exciting counter for Mexicans in both the United States and Mexico was not his meeting with President Joe Biden, but his impromptu encounter with well-wishers outside his hotel room at the Lombardi. Some of them have driven from places like Chicago and New York just to get a glimpse of their president. So this guy, AMLO, he's pretty much a socialist. He is very, very popular in the country of Mexico among working people. Um, he's done things like like raise the age of Social Security or make it available to more people, and that's just been you know incredibly successful. Um, the video of the counter, which must have been a nightmare for the Secret Service protecting him, went viral, obviously. It showed the president, known by the initials AMLO, sticking his head out the window, blowing kisses, catching a bouquet of flowers thrown to him, and being serenaded by mariachis, singing the song Amigo. Um, that is that is a pretty cool moment. It's good to have a politician that people abs- like actually respect. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, it's... You know, that is a El Hotel Lombardi donde AMLO se osbero Washington. Cuanto cuesta y como es. Uh, so that's the video. That's how it was reported in La Nación. That is a uh, Spanish news or a Mexican newspaper. Um, I'm sure you um, have definitely, if, you, if you're a Spanish speaker, you probably are just cringing, of course, on how, um, <laughs> how I, um, um, have decided to just kind of process it there, but um, or just l- or relay that information to you. But let's see, see if we can get a little bit of the clip there. It's probably just going to be um, probably going to be a bunch of like chattering anyway. But uh, oh, here it is. Here's the video of him. He's looking out the window of this hotel, kind of on this street, and everyone you can hear people just like kind of calling out to him in, in Spanish. And coming out, just catching, you know, throwing out flowers to him, just being like, hey, running over, yelling at him, and just being like, hey, what's up? And, uh, yeah, Hotel Lombardi there in Washington. Um, AMLO showered with them with praise, the, the, the people there, thanking them for them for their sacrifice in coming to the United States and working hard to send money back to their families in Mexico. You are heroes and heroines, he said with a huge grin. Our economy is rising. 
uh, because of what you sent to your relatives. You are exceptional migrants. I love you very much. He shared his, for, with them his plans to meet with President Biden, put for immigration reforms so they could come back legally. The adoring crowd shouted back, we love you, President. We are with you. Uh, he's got a 66% appro- approval rating right now in Mexico, one of the highest of all world leaders. This is by the myriad problems, of course, that continue to plague the nation, inflation, corruption, and violence. And the thing is, he seems at least like to the people of Mexico, he is ac- like he's really just trying to, to do something. Um, AMLO has plenty of detractors, as I'm sure you can imagine, primarily in the business community. Critics from the right condemn his populist economic policies, such as nationalization of lithium. They say he has centralized power and does not tolerate dissent, of course, all this, you know, Democrat, anti-democratic uh, kind of concern, this worry about all these fears, these all of a sudden we're seeing a bunch of repression, um, and, you know, lack of uh, political uh, respect for differences from AMLO. All of a sudden, the moment he decided to start thinking about nationalizing lithium, I think that is, you know, a very telling. Critics say he's complicit with repressive U.S. immigration policies and has reneged on his promises to defend indigenous rights and is not done enough to stop the horrific wave of femicides and attacks on journalists. Very, very sad. Uh, you know, of course, a bunch of problems in Mexico and some pretty legit, I'd say probably legitimate criticisms, although I know very little about what's actually going on in Mexico at the moment. Um, but, you know, very, know very little about, um, you know, the situation there, but I'm sure there's some pretty legitimate criticisms in what is obviously a very tough uh, environment ravaged by years of just brutal economic uh, and foreign policy from the United States. But, of course, his fans see him as a man of the people who rode to power on December 1st, 2018, with an overwhelming mandate to break with his with the corrupt parties that had ruled Mexico for almost a century. One of his first acts was to cut his own salary by half and slash the wages of most other top officials. He put the extravagant presidential plane up for sale, preferring to travel in economy class on commercial flights. I think, you know, those kind of moves with any country, with any group of people help a lot because people actually see, like, hey, we're, you're doing something. You care about us. You're, tr- you're, like, you're trying to make a difference. You're not trying to just live in luxury here. Um, you know, he opened up the foreign president palace to the public, allowing millions of Mexican tourists uh, to enjoy the palatial home and gardens. Another reason for the president's popularity is extraordinary effort he puts into communicating with the public, perhaps more than any other leader in the world. From the day he took office, he's been holding uh, kind of marathon press conferences from Monday to Friday, um, starting at 7 a.m. and lasting for two uh, to three hours, uh, called La Maniera. The conferences are broadcast live on public television, streamed on a dedicated YouTube channel, as well as directly on the president's official website. The uh, president's office estimates that the astounding 10 million people, 10 million people, watch the president's press conference uh, you know, on a daily basis. A link to scripted press events in the United States. These are free-flowing discussions where the president talks in a folksy style about everything from COVID, infrastructure projects, uh, and, and the migrant crisis to Mexico's best foods, in the cheapest places to buy gasoline. He speaks in a slow, conversational t- tone, breaking down political jargon into to digestible concepts and taking unscripted questions from the press, claiming that the mainstream media often misinform the public or ignore key issues. Amlo ironically uses these press conferences to bypass the media and take his message directly to the people. And something that, you know, We've seen politicians, a lot of politicians, definitely the more populous ones, try and do. You know, we saw Trump, you know, try and do it, I guess, through Twitter. But um, this is something that is just done actually genuinely. Um, it can make you see the world of difference, difference it makes for his people. Um, but the thing is, AMLO is more than just a popular Mexican president. He's been a pretty leading progressive figure for the Americas. He has garnered support and gratitude for his bold actions he's taken in solidarity with beleaguered leftist leaders and nations after the Organization of American States sparked a coup against Evo Morales. This was absolutely huge here. AMLO sent a plane to whisk Morales out of the country and offer him asylum in Mexico. Morales believes AMLO saved his life. And let me tell you, it would have been a big blow uh, to the coup or to the resistance effort to that coup in Bolivia and a, you know, if AMLO hadn't saved Morales' life and he'd just been, you know, paraded around dead in that country, who knows if they would have been able to have democratic elections two years later. But I think that's much more down to, the, you know, the strength of their, um, you know, democratic organized labor labor movements. But, you know, that's kind of another uh, discussion there entirely. Um, he has also offered to uh, asylum to jailed whistleblower Julian Assange and recently he suggested that the Statue of Liberty should be dismantled and returned to France if Assange is extradited and imprisoned 
uh, in the United States. You know, he's got a very fair point there. Uh, close friend of Cuba. Imo sent a much needed shipments of food and medicine and fuel to the island during the height of pandemic. Announced in May 2022 that Mexico would hire more than 500 Cuban doctors to help make up for a shortage of medical professionals in rural Mexico. He's railed against his U.S. sanctions on Cuba, calling them depraved and a key reason that the Cubans are migrating, which is all, you know, clearly true. He said the people of uh, Cuba deserve a de- dignity award for resisting U.S. interference for 60 years. The entire country should be declared a world heritage site. T- totally agree. It's you know, a very fair thing to say. You know, this guy, guy sounding sounding pretty good to me uh, thus far. Um, he's uh, Mexico's hosted dialogues between Venezuelan government and the country's opposition and resisted U.S. pressure to recognize opposition leader Juan Guaido as interim president, this absolute loser who's tried to, you know, pretty much straight out of Langley, who's tried to organize a bunch of, you know, these these coups that have been failing all over the place as, you know, the Venezuelan economy just is struggling just now even to recover from the crippling sanctions of the Trump era. Uh, Mexico and AMLO's hem- hemispheric supporters also appreciate his recurring call for the Spanish king and Catholic church to apologize for the conquest of Latin America. But AMLO's position as regional leader was really boosted by his refusal to attend President Biden's June 2022 Summer of the Americas in L.A. because of the exclusion of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. This had a snowball effect, prompting the other heads of states to skip the gathering and turning Biden's summit into a flop. The Summit of the Americas has been closely associated with the OAS, which is, of course, the same organization that sparked the coup in Bolivia and is deeply tied, by the way, to the United States deep state and government itself. AMLO has called for replacing the OAS with a truly autonomous body, a lackey to no one. A substitute would be the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. By the way, a body that most likely would not include the United States. Um, its goal is to stimulate Latin American and Caribbean independence, integration, and autonomy, making the Caribbean and Latin American region an absolutely strong and united economic unit that would be incredibly exciting to stay by the way for the future mexico's 2021 hosting the CELAC summit attended by almost all the leaders of the region gave the body a huge boost amlo and some of the other latin american leaders have taken this concept of latin american integration a step further calling for a european european union of sorts with a single currency and a right to cross its borders it turns back to the dream of simon bolivar to create a unified latin america when it comes to relations with the united states however amlo walks a fine line between railing against U.S. policy toward Latin America and maintaining a positive relationship, even under Donald Trump. Mexico is no alternative, AMLO believes, because it shares a 2,000-mile border, and there are, by Mexico's government's calculations, some 40 million Mexicans living in the United States. Even more than that, 80% of Mexican exports go to the United States, but AMLO insists that the 200-year U.S. domination of Latin America has been exhausted and must come to an end. We are not a protectorate, a colony, or anyone's backyard, he declared in a groundbreaking July 2021 speech. We say adios to the impositions, interference, sanctions, exclusions, and blockade. Instead, he called for a relationship based on non-intervention, self-determination, and peaceful resolution of conflicts. Um, these ideas are resonating more than ever across Latin America, with the new left tides leaving the continent, the election of Gustavo Petro in Colombia being the latest and most spectacular, given the country's close alliance with the United States. If Lula wins in Brazil in the com- country's upcoming elections, the continent will be ripe for new regional architecture and setting its own terms for relations with the U.S. The continent will also be grasping for new models of development that don't rely on extractivism and corporate profits, but improving the quality of life and of the environment. Millions across the hemisphere will look to new leaders as well as AMLO and CELAC to help navigate that process. So it's a very, very exciting time to be following Latin American politics and probably a better, you know, I'm not living there, but it would be a pretty cool time to be a resident of a Latin American country under one of these governments, in my opinion. All right. AMLO killing it there as always. Let's move on to our last story of the day. Um, this is in the Intercept. Akila Lacey, by the way, last two stories in Jacobin. Um, uh, so a company linked to the father of a Missouri Democrat congress- congressional contender is funding a political action committee attacking his opponent, according to the filings of the new federal election committee. Y- uh, Yachad Pack. Uh, this is literally what it's called. Your Chad Pack is a new committee spending against Representative Cory Bush. Yes, she is facing a primary once again, or actually this is going to be her first time, but hopefully she'll be able to hold it off. Um, you know, so this is a, again, a big continuation, a long theme of 
uh, people who are challenging members of the squad getting Republican funding. This is going to be no different. This uh, Chad pack is run by Republican operative Paul Zem, uh, Zemich, Zemich uh, local news outlet Kate. SDK reported on Wednesday the group has received contributions from former Democratic Representative William Lacey Clay, whom Bush ousted in 2002, uh, Clay's sister, and the former Director of Communications. So, but the PAC's recent FEC filings revealed that its primary fa- uh, funder is uh, <laughs> a company linked to the father of Bush's opponent, State Senator Stephen Roberts Jr. And uh, by the way, William Lacey Clay was the guy who was in the seat uh, before in pretty much one of those ancestral seats that is kind of around the country, kind of passed down from friend to father to son, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now, so the old guys are helping this guy unseat Corey Bush. Um, SCD Investments Group, LLC, with investment group of Robert's father, Stephen C. Robert Sr., has had multiple titles and gave the PAC $1,600 in May. Robert Sr. was previously listed in 2013 as the company's member in Missouri Public Records and as manager in a state of Florida filing. He was also the company's registered agent in 2013, until 2013, in the record of its donations to Yachad Pack. <laughs> what the hell is that name? I swear. Uh, the company lists an address shared by several Roberts family companies. Robert Sr. did not respond to the Intercept's request for comment. And, you know, with that being said... um. You know, it it just definitely does show what really is. You know, why the Democratic Party is a fundamentally broken political institution. Like, this is like whenever there's any kind of new voice, any kind of dissenting voice, they cannot be allowed to thrive. And even when they're relatively tame, like an AOC type person, like she's not nearly as threatening to the Democratic Party as the Tea Party was, unfortunately, to uh, the Republican Party. Um, you know, they really actually changed the dynamic and pushed the you know pushed the party not just in rhetoric left but in policy uh, sorry in policy right and in rhetoric but i think aoc you know we ha- have to be honest here so as much as we may respect her for some of the, you know the uh, moves that she's made um she has just not done that she just has not done that she's failed in that task um and even though uh she has just kind of been proved to be a pretty unaffected representative she's just been ruthlessly I wouldn't say ruthlessly, but she's been, I'm sure, uh, you know, she's, she says she said some of it, but I think we've already seen, like, she's been subject to a lot of kind of a pressure and harassment uh, that she's really, I think, bent the knee to um, in this situation. And even Cori Bush, who hasn't really done that much, except for, you know, embarrassed Biden, I think, once on the eviction moratorium, um, you know, to make his life miserable. It's just getting onslaught by, you know, local uh, party people like there, there's no support for any of these people there's no support for any new ideas or any kind of vibrancy especially from minority women i've been noticing um in the democratic party and that is something that has just been really frankly ruthlessly uh snuffed out as the democratic party i think continues its death drive um on that note so we got for you guys today we'll be back soon uh hopefully on tuesday it's been newsflash